Dr. Jose P. Rizal was considered one of the most influential thinkers of the Philippine Revolution, and it's not hard to see why. His writings, as well as the organization he founded, were essential to uniting Filipinos into rising up against the Spaniards, even well after his death. His world-famous duology, Noli Matanghere and El Filibusterismo, have been passed down for generations for young Filipinos to read and study, and for today, we'll be focusing on the latter of the two, El Filibusterismo. Just a quick background, El Fili was first published in 1891 and centers on the Noli's protagonist, Crisostomo Ibarra, returning to the Philippines 13 years after his death, a completely changed person. He had abandoned all thought of idealism and peaceful revolution and had become convinced that sabotage and violence were the only ways to get to results. The dark themes and violent plots of Philly are a sudden depart from the romantic and hopeful airs of its predecessors, and because of the book's blatant exposure of the abuses committed by the Spanish government and the church, the books were outright banned in some areas of the country. Talk about that cheap. So, our story begins on the steamboat Tabo as it makes its way up the Pasig River from Manila on its way to Laguna de Bay. The boat is split into two decks, the top that has all the illustrious and rich passengers, and the bottom where basically everyone else is staying, which, by the way, is an interesting show of symbolism that represented the social hierarchy back then. On the top, we had the rich and non Spanish, then their confidants, and at the bottom are the Indios or the natives and the poorer Chinamen. Among our passengers on this ship are Ibarra, who is now known as Simon, the rich jeweler, Doña Victorina, the ridiculously pro-Spanish India woman who is in search of her estranged husband, Paulita Gomez, the pretty and rich orphan niece of the Doña, Ben Zaib, a prolific Spanish journalist, Padres Sibilia, Camora, Salvi, Irene, and Florentino, Don Custodio, a high-up and well-respected pro-Spanish Filipino, Isagani, Padre Florentino's nephew, as well as the lover of Paulita, and Basilio, if you can recall from the last book, the son of Sisa, who is now about to graduate medical school, thanks to his patron, Capitan Diago. Simon, as mentioned before, is now bitter and cynical, and only believes that violence and sabotage is the only way to overthrow the Spanish government, and he plants himself as an agitator and saboteur, violently siding with the Spaniards and encouraging abuse against the masses which would stir up a revolution, basically making himself the bad guy, which I find very admirable. He lost everything and returns willing to lose everything a second time so the revolution may push through. Albeit his methods are all that successful, spoiler alert. Anywho, Simon is able to smuggle firearms into the country through Kiroga, a rich Chinese merchant that owes Simon a great deal of money. His first plot, however, is kind of botched by the fact that he's told that Maria Clara had died by Basilio. That absolute intellectual. Anyways, back to the story. On Christmas Eve, Basilio is back in San Diego, which is the town where Capitan Tiago lives and is also the place where the events of Noli take place, and slips out into a forest property that was once owned by Ibarra to visit the graves of his mother Sisa and the revolutionary Elias. So when he gets there, he finds that he isn't the first to arrive there and surprise surprise, it's our old pal Simon. So stuff happens, lives are threatened, revelations are made, and Simon tries to get Basilio to join the revolution, using what happened to his mother and brother at the hands of the Spaniards against him. Basilio is understandably shaken up by this, but tells Simon that he'll still have to think about it. See, Basilio is in love with this girl named Juli, who is the daughter of Cabezang Tales, a man who had once been successful, but had everything stolen from him by the friars, and while trying to guard what he had left, he was captured by bandits that held him at a very high ransom, and to pay that ransom, Juli had to offer herself as a servant to Hermana Penchang, a pious Catholic. Basilio heard about all of this, so with his savings, he freed Juli from her obligations to Hermana Penchang and bought a small house that Juli and her grandfather, Tandangzelo, could live in. Another thing about Basilio is, he's part of a student group that is pushing to have a school for the Spanish language built but have so far been heavily opposed by the Dominicans for some reason. 
the students do end up having the plan for their school approved, but they don't get to manage the teaching. I guess that's still worth celebrating because they go over to a panciteria to celebrate their victory with dinner. Everyone except Basilio, who had to stay with Capitan Tiago because he was sick. While eating, the students end up mocking some of the priests and even Don Custodio, but unknown to them, there was someone watching and listening in on their conversation. The next day, Basilio wanders over to the university to find that all classes had been suspended because rebellious posters and notes had been posted all over the doors at the school and that the students that had been at the gathering the night before had been arrested. So Basilio, in true shonen anime protagonist fashion, hurries over to the house of the leader of the student group and they are both subsequently arrested. So Basilio, with nobody to vouch for him, because Capitan Tiago had what? So Capitan Tiago's dead, and Basilio sat in prison and stayed there, long after all the students had been taken home by their families. When Huli hears of this, she tries her best to get support to have Basilio released, and this doesn't work. So with no one else to go to, she reluctantly heads over to the convent to ask help from Padre Camora, which ultimately wasn't a good idea because that meeting ends up with Huli jumping out of the convent wi window to get away from him. Man! So eventually, it's Simon who gets Basili out of prison using his super cool connections, but because of his experiences in there, as well as the news of the death of Huli, Basilio executes a flawless Ibarra 180 and joins the band of rebels that Simon had organized. Also, while they were all in prison, Paulita decided to leave Isagani for the other boy she had in her life, Juanito Pelaez, a Spanish mestizo. Simon was able to hasten the preparations for the wedding by offering a loan to Juanito's father so that he could buy the house of the now late Capitan Tiago. Later, Simon reveals his big plan to Basilio. The wedding was going to be a very big event, so naturally, a lot of very important Spanish officials and people would be there. He would give the newlyweds a beautiful looking lamp that was filled with a highly explosive chemical nitroglycerin. When the lamp began to dim, someone would move over there and relight it, causing the nitroglycerin to explode, setting off the gunpowder that laced the corners of the house, causing an even larger explosion, killing everyone inside. The explosion would act as a signal for the other rebels to start the general rebellion in Manila, thus marking the start of the Philippine Revolution. Surprisingly, Basilio is cool with the entire plan. Come on, man. Just your not dead girlfriend, thank. Later, Basilio wanders near the ill-fated wedding and runs into Sagani, the crestfallen lover of Paulita. Seeing as the house was rigged to explode, Basilio, the highly intellectual person he is, tells Isagani Nisimon's entire plot. Isagani reacts about as well as you'd think and rushes into the house as soon as the lamplight began dying and tosses it into the river, diving in as well not too far after. This ruins the entire scheme and Simon is exposed as a traitor, eventually ending up being chased by the Guardia Civil with guns, again. When the house failed to explode, the rebels took things into their own hands and attacked all too early and were destroyed by the Guardia Civil. So if you weren't keeping count, Simon is now on the run from an angry government and an angry band of rebels. Wounded and ruined, Simon makes his way to the home of Padre Florentino, who takes him in and tries his best to heal him. A couple of days later, Padre Florentino receives a letter to telling him to warn his Spanish guest that the Guardia Sibyl were coming in a week's time to arrest him and that they were armed with guns. Don Tiburcio, who had been there the entire length of the book, takes one look at the letter and yeets off. Simon hears about the letter and 
deciding that dying was better than being captured takes poison. On his deathbed, Simon tells Padre Florentino everything, his full name, what he'd been doing, the full nolly, and F Padre Florentino listens to the full story, and this takes the better part of the day. And when all that is said and done, Simon finally and does actually die. So there you have it, after several botched love stories, a vengeful plan gone wrong, and many, many, many character deaths, is El Filibusterismo. Long story short, not everyone bites the dust. Bye.